Hi everyone, Ollie here and welcome back to the channel. It's the first video of 2020, the start of a brand new decade. Uh, I hope you've all had a fantastic Christmas if you were celebrating, good holiday season and a good new year. My new year's resolution, as it were, is to improve the quality of my videos and I realised after doing an online videography and cinematography course um, over the Christmas break that the lighting in a lot of my videos has been garbage. So I'm starting to experiment with a few more things. I've invested in some more equipment because um, I want to make the videos look better for you guys. Hopefully even something as simple as what I've done here, um, lighting set up properly, looks a little bit better. So let me know. But you are not here to talk about video, you are here to talk about medical interviews. So some of the most common feedback that I get from you guys and what I experience when I'm doing the mock interviews with you is that people sometimes struggle with ethical dilemmas. These seem to be a, a wide area of concern. People particularly feel like they're running out of steam. You know, once you've considered the four pillars of medical ethics, which should always be your go-to choices when thinking about answering questions like this, you know, you see your consultant come in drunk one day, or you encounter a Jehovah's Witness in a roadside accident who needs a blood transfusion. Any of these ethical dilemmas can be tackled this way. But sometimes people feel that that's not enough. So today, what we're gonna talk about are three additional ethical viewpoints that you can think about when you're trying to answer ethical questions. I need to preface this whole thing by saying, knowledge of these additional viewpoints is absolutely not compulsory for your interviews. While I think it's fair for med schools to ask about the four pillars of medical ethics because they're considered pretty universal knowledge, these additional standpoints, which I myself only learned about in medical school, they might help you tackle your answers from a different perspective and come up with some more answers that might surprise your interviewers. So don't worry if you've never heard of these things right now, we're going to go through each of them, try and apply them to a medical scenario, and then even if you don't use them, they will come in handy during med school and later during your medical career. So the first and most widely understood of these principles is that of utilitarianism. The notion that the choice or the path which produces the most good for the most people is the correct course of action. And this approach is actually valid in many settings beyond medicine. It's really common in things like economics, business management, human resources, anything where you're managing a finite set of resources. So just thinking medically, if you were trying to choose a drug which you were going to give to your population to try and prevent incidents of heart disease, whichever one prevented the most cases of heart disease for as low a cost as possible, would be the best choice because it stretches your set of resources the furthest and achieves the most good with them. This is unfortunately a fairly straightforward example and in healthcare it doesn't often work like that. So to begin with any utility which is the value that we use in utilitarianism the utility has to be able to be measured in some way and this is a reasonable task to do with something like incidents of disease or years of life that you live, you can just measure those. But as soon as we get into more nebulous domains, such as thinking about people's mental health or quality of life, where there's not necessarily an objective measure, we start to struggle. And there is also a slight problem with this approach in that technically speaking, it focuses on what is best for society as a whole, not the individuals in question. However, in practice, um, we do see these approaches being used. The NHS and NICE, which set the clinical guidelines that all doctors and healthcare professionals use, they developed something called the QALY, the Quality Adjusted Life Year, which we've talked about in videos before. And this allows you to assign utility and value to particular states of health, and then we can use that to determine, you know, if this drug buys us this many qualies for this much money, then that's how much value it has, and we can compare that to other treatments. The second major system I want to talk about is that of deontology. Essentially adherence to a set of rules and duties, and this was most famously proposed by Immanuel Kant. And essentially it dictates that following the correct set of rules is the guide to good moral behaviour. In this case, the means that are used to achieve an end are much more important than the end that is achieved, which places it in a completely stark contrast to utilitarianism, which is very much the ends justify the means. There are several things with Kantian deontological thought. The first is that of universalism, and this principle basically says that 
If you choose to do something in any given situation when you're making a medical decision, you must morally and logically accept anyone else taking the exact same action in the same or a similar situation. Secondly, you should never treat other human beings as a means to an end but respect the notion that we all have our own, you know, values and things that we want to try and achieve. So it's not acceptable to use either patients or our colleagues as a means to achieve something that we personally want. If you really want to publish a case report because it'll help you get marks with your applications, but the patient says they don't want to be included, it is not justifiable just because it's something you want to use that patient as a means to satisfying your end. And that's because someone basically can't consent uh, rationally to being used as a means for someone else's end, if that makes sense. And lastly, can't actually encourage people to behave in such a way or according to a set of morals that a reasonable society full of rationally autonomously acting people would set in their society as laws. And this is something interesting to think about because the way that our society uses laws and rules, you know, in terms of what medical practitioners are and aren't allowed to do, is often not a moral decision, but it comes from some other school of thought. If you're going to make a medical decision for your patient, you have to be, you know, comfortable with the knowledge that another medical practitioner outside of you would make the same call in that situation and that would be an okay thing to do both from your point of view and the patient and the patient's family and society as a whole. And the last of the major ethical theories that I want to discuss with you today is that of virtue ethics and it's probably a little bit easier to understand than Kantian deontology. Now this school of thought was the product of Socrates and later built on by people like Aristotle and Plato. So generally speaking, the focus of virtue ethics is the traits and characteristics that a person might possess, but not just the traits they possess, but how these traits manifest them in that person's behavior and in society, specifically characteristics that would make someone a good person. And there's massive disagreement by the different philosophical authors on what the most important traits are for people to hold, but we're just gonna discuss some of them that have been agreed on essentially throughout the history of this philosophy and then look at how we might apply them in a medical situation. And these are the ones that would be really valuable for a modern doctor to try and possess. So Plato um, wrote of what we call the four cardinal virtues. These are prudence, which is the ability to know what to do in a given situation, what the correct course of action is. Courage or fortitude, which is the ability to be able to deal with an unfamiliar situation and confront your own fear. Uh, temperance, which is basically self-restraint, not acting when it's unsuitable to do so, even if you might want to. And finally, justice, fairness or righteousness. And obviously justice appears as part of our four pillars of classical medical ethics. Now, interestingly, maybe in contrast to the four pillars, historically justice was actually considered to be the most important of these cardinal virtues and has since come to be represented in society and throughout history by the balance and scales, which now serves as an international symbol of law. And when you start looking for them, these cardinal virtues appear everywhere um, throughout modern history. They've been talked about by Cicero, Dante in the Divine Comedy. I think they're in the wisdom of Solomon. And even if we look at sort of the lunette fresco that um, Raphael painted that's now in the Vatican, you see representations of these things absolutely everywhere. And they're really simple to use because we just have to ask ourselves, what would a virtuous person do in this situation? A trauma surgeon, for example, has to be courageous because they're going to be dealing things where anything could come through the door from a gunshot wound to a stabbing, you know, an improvised explosive device firing shrapnel everywhere, all massively uncertain. They have to use their medical experience and knowledge to guide their actions almost immediately because these wounds can often be life threatening. Thinking about righteousness, are their actions fair? You know, should they treat enemy combatants the same way that they should treat their own troops? Should you spend more time operating on one patient over another? You can save this guy's legs and his ability to walk and he can go home to his two children. But in doing that, you leave, you know, the 21 year old new recruit to bleed out in the corner. What if you make a mistake due to being overly tired 
or bringing your own problems into work and not focusing properly? Is it the same if you make a mistake when operating on an enemy? You know, whose fault is any of this? These are all questions that can't really be answered, but they have to shape our judgment. And I do apologize, this has been a really heavy kind of philosophical video, but as I've said before, there's great wisdom in history and in philosophy. And we can use these perspectives in unknown situations, particularly when we're dealing with ethical dilemmas in our interviews. We've been through the four pillars of ethics, we've come to some sort of conclusion, but we've still got some time to fill, or maybe the interviewer wants a bit more. Have a think about the utilitarian approach. Most net gain for the most people, for the fewest resources. Deontology, are we following the rules? Is it better to break the rules? to achieve a better outcome for our particular patient, but breaking the rules might not be moral. And lastly, virtue ethics. What would Jesus do <laughs> in this situation? Just to reiterate one final time, it's almost certain, and probably 100% certain, that you will not be asked to outline any of these ethical doctrines during your interview, but hand on heart, they can be really helpful during medical school. They will be when you're practicing as a doctor, and they might just save you in a pinch in your interview. So thanks very much for watching, guys. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe. Don't forget to go and check out postgradmedic.com for more free interview videos just like this. Tell a friend, because the biggest thing that helps me is sharing, reaching new viewers, and helping you all get that step closer to medical school. If you want to support the channel, guys, there are three ways to do it. Like, subscribe, comment, share it with a friend. You can buy me a coffee using my Ko-Fi link in the description below, or you can save 10% off your first year of Complete Anatomy 2020, my favorite 3D anatomy simulation tool. Use my referral link in the description below, and I'll get a small kickback when you do. Take care, and I'll see you next time.